Good morning. Good morning. I'm really thrilled to be here and have the honor of addressing you. But first, I want to congratulate my friend David Scorton on his phenomenal leadership of this venerable institution called the Smithsonian. And to you, John Gray, for your stewardship of this jewel, this jewel of a museum that richly represents the very best of America. And of course, a big thanks to David Rubenstein for all that he has done for the Smithsonian and for American philanthropy in general. David is indeed a testament to the idea that each generation can produce a new Rockefeller or Carnegie. I also want to acknowledge on the front row Irene Hirano Inouye, my former chair of the trustees at the Ford Foundation, who in some ways I owe my being here because Irene was chair when I was appointed president. So thank you, Irene, for being here. I do, I do want to say that I love being in this building. I love being in this museum and walking the halls. I am exhilarated by the many different exhibitions I see. From City of Hope, an exhibit about the Poor People's Campaign, to the celebration of our nation's rich history of civic participation in the American Democracy exhibit. The Smithsonian, by highlighting movements for justice, by spotlighting and celebrating the power of democracy. The Smithsonian captures the themes of this conference so well. It embodies both the promise of America and the power of giving, in part because, well, as we know, it was a gift. James Smithson's gift of a half a million dollars to, and I quote, increase the diffusion of knowledge, unquote, remains one of the most extraordinary acts of philanthropy in American history. So the power of giving is imbued in every element of this building, of the Smithsonian idea and indeed the American idea. And while we're here in the Museum of American History at a conference on philanthropy, I think it seems it would be appropriate to ask the question, what is the history of American philanthropy? And how might we learn from our history and move towards a better future? In light of these questions, I was happy last night to be part of a group who was given a tour of the Giving in America exhibit curated by Amanda Moniz. It offers a look at giving through the centuries in this country from a collection box dating before the Civil War to a bucket used in the ice bucket challenge. There's also a bust of Andrew Carnegie, which of course makes sense because Carnegie's story is where the arc of the great American foundations begins. From Rockefeller to Rosenwald to Gates to a new generation of millennial philanthropists. As, you, as many of you know, Carnegie lived the American dream. He was the son of poor immigrants who rose to become one of the wealthiest men in the world. And in 1889, Carnegie wrote his seminal essay that we now refer to as the gospel of wealth, which has come to define American philanthropy. He wrote about the power of wealthy individuals to create and again, I'm quoting here, benefactions from which the masses of their fellows will derive lasting, lasting advantage and thus dignify, dignify their own lives. It's worth remembering that Carnegie articulated his philosophy at a time when inequality had reached unprecedented levels in America. And in our own era, our own time, of rising inequality, we should openly acknowledge and confront a tension inherent in our economic, political, and social systems. This tension is plain to see. Our systems perpetuate vast differences in privilege and then task the privilege, those of us in this room, people like us, with improving the very systems that benefit the privileged. 
My thinking about this and my thinking about philanthropy has been informed by the philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Because exactly 50 years ago, almost to this day, he said the following to a group of philanthropists. Philanthropy is commendable, but it must not cause the philanthropist to overlook the circumstances of economic injustice which make philanthropy necessary. To me, this has been my guiding star, and this is the guiding star that we use at the Ford Foundation. Indeed, it is our guiding light. Dr. King challenges us to dig into the root causes of suffering and injustice and to not overlook the circumstances and systems and structures that make our work necessary. And so a few years ago, I started to think, what would a new, a new gospel of wealth look like? One that pushes philanthropy beyond generosity, that indeed pushes philanthropy to justice. Because the power of giving is not about what money can do for one organization. The power is how we use our resources. The power is in how we deploy strategically and thoughtfully those resources so that we can spark lasting systemic change in society. And so to me, generosity is about charity. Justice is about equity. And the Smithsonian is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. James Smithson's bequest was undoubtedly an act of enormous generosity to the people of the United States. And in recent years, we have seen this institution push beyond generosity towards justice and inclusion. You need look no further than the National Museum of the American Indian, or the Museum of African American History and Culture, or the new Asian Pacific American Center, and most recently, the American Women's History Initiative. And I'm very proud to say that the Ford Foundation has supported each of these initiatives because these efforts seek to broaden the extraordinary narrative of the American experiment. Another great example is installed in the Albert Smalls Gallery here in a remarkable exhibit called Writing a Wrong, Japanese Americans and World War II. It documents the 75th anniversary of Executive Order 9066, which imprisoned 75,000 American, American citizens of Japanese ancestry during World War II. By including exhibits like this, the National Museum of American History is courageously fulfilling its mission. It's telling an American story that is more comprehensive, more authentic, and more complete. The Smithsonian's exciting progress is but one of many examples of how we are seeing the new gospel of wealth manifest today. Indeed, it is often through the arts, the arts where we see the philosophies of Carnegie and Rockefeller and King converge, a space where we can give dignity to others while interrogating our own circumstances. And there are indeed a few reasons for this. For one, the arts allow us to imagine, to have hope for ourselves and compassion for others, to confront the world we live in and imagine a better world. I know this firsthand because my life story rests on this idea. When I was a little boy, I lived with my mother and sister in a little shotgun house in a small African-American community in rural Liberty County, Texas. My grandmother worked as a maid in the home of a wealthy Houston family. And every month, she'd drive out to Liberty County, and she would bring old art magazines and programs from the cultural events the family attended. I remember vividly feeling transfixed by the magic I saw on those pages. Images of a world, worlds that I had no exposure to. Those pages unlocked my capacity to imagine a world beyond my own situation 
on that little dirt road in that little town in rural Texas. I can honestly say I would not be here with you now but for my experience with the arts. And I know that so many of you in this audience feel as passionately about the arts as I do. Because for many of us, the arts allow us to understand our place within society, to have our feelings expressed through the language of a writer or the movement of a dancer or the music of a composer. And as a society, artists give us the ability to not just imagine what is possible, but artists help us to understand our past and who we are as a people. One of my favorite artists is the poet Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes was deeply patriotic. He had an unwavering, unyielding love for his country. And his poem that comes to mind to me most often my favorite Hughes poem was published in 1936 in Esquire magazine. And my favorite stanza is the following one. I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. In these lines, we understand the connection between the injustice and inequality suffered by many people in America in the 1930s. And Langston Hughes can empathize with them all regardless of their race or country of origin. That's what the arts have the power to do. Throughout our history, we have seen artists and activists work hand in hand. We have seen art inspire and elevate whole movements for change. And progress in our pursuit of justice is absolutely linked to progress in the arts. Think about it. What would the LGBT rights movement be without Tony Kushner or Larry Kramer? The fight for immigrants without Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton? Or the Me Too, Time's Up diversity in the Hollywood movement without A Wrinkle in Time and Black Panther? My point is that the arts have the power to bring us together and help us bridge divides. And by creating more understanding and empathy, together we can build a more just society. So we must do all that we can to protect and promote the arts in America. And finally this morning, I ask that as we consider today's agenda, think about the power of art, not just to inspire awe, but to inspire empathy and action I ask you to think about the power of giving, not only as a matter of generosity, but as an imperative to do justice in our nation and in our world. Thank you so much for this great honor of speaking to you. And I believe we have time for a few questions. Yes. That was a wonderful talk. The Smithsonian is deeply involved in the preservation of cultural heritage, yes. uh, especially uh, intangible cultural heritage, you know, maybe we don't have it quite focused. We, we focus so much on uh, underdeveloped countries, uh, countries in war zones. Would you think there's a role for such an effort in the developed countries like our own? Without the stories, you don't have any of the uh, points that you, were, uh, that you were talking about. Well, one of the things I do admire is the very rich oral history program that you have here at the Smithsonian, and I've seen that firsthand at the new uh, National Museum of African American uh, Culture and History, which is really, uh, I think Lonnie has done a remarkable job of scouring the countryside for narratives and for oral histories, because it is, it's those narratives that actually will live on. And particularly today with the digital capacity that the Smithsonian has, which is 
uh, pretty remarkable. Your ability to capture stories across this country is pretty unparalleled. So I encourage you and I encourage you philanthropists to fund that work because storytelling and capturing those stories is really, really important. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, please. I'm sorry. Hi, uh, as a historian who's involved with the Women's History uh, Initiative, I want to thank the Ford Foundation for the support that you've given. It's very, very important. Uh, but I have another set of questions. Um, Amanda Moniz and Dr. Squirton talked about how the, the <coughs> Smithsonian could engage the, pu the general public. And my, I have actually two questions that are sort of about the relationship between philanthropy and our government. First of all, um, why should, the, why should the wealthy, you said the, the, the wealthy have the power to do certain things. Why should the wealthy be the ones to decide how their money is being used? Uh, our tax system is set up so that people get deductions for contributions to, uh, to charity, to, to uh, philanthropy. And that means that that money is taken out of the public treasury and given over to people who will decide how it's, how it's going to be used. So how can the public sort of be engaged in that? How can the public have some voice in how that is used? And then secondly, what should be the balance, this is not so much about the Smithsonian, but sort of our safety net in general, what should be the balance between philanthropy and public expenditures for, say, social welfare or the, or the, or the social safety net? Thank you. Thank you, those are two great questions. And one, we should just address the fact that there are, uh, that there is growing concern that uh, private philanthropy and private wealth is driving public agendas. But we should put that in historical context. Uh, John D. Rockefeller um, decided with a group of scientists that um, America should have a public health system. And he didn't wait for the government to create that. Um, he went about doing it. Um, Andrew Carnegie decided that we needed, America needed literacy. Um, he didn't wait for government to do that. Um, he decided as a matter of a public interest that he should ex uh, exert his influence and his wealth to ensure that that happened. Um, and he was relentless um, in, in pursuit of that objective. I think the challenge for today is that both Carnegie and Rockefeller had a belief that the ultimate function of their philanthropy was to make it possible to scale so that government could, in fact, ultimately sustain whatever innovation. So whether it was the Bureau of Economics uh, that now is a part of the United States government, uh, or our early work, uh, or Rockefeller's uh, early work um, in public health, uh, the notion was that uh, the sanitation commissions that were being set up by Rockefeller would ultimately become public health systems um, run by government. And I think today the concern is that um, some in philanthropy even have sought to discredit uh, the belief that government should be doing any of these activities and that it can be um, managed wholly by philanthropy, which we know is simply uh, factually not possible. All of philanthropy uh, together uh, is a rounding error to the budget of our, our federal government. So the actual capacity and financial wherewithal to do the work of government, um, I mean, that's just a fallacy. Um, and I understand ideologically why people may disagree with that. But I think it is important that we encourage private wealth to be deployed in the public interest. It's just important that we think about, for example, as I think about um, this issue on, let's just say, um, health research. Um, there's, there have been billions uh, allocated to health research by private individuals who have a deep uh, desire to, uh, to work to reduce the disease burden in this country and in the world. What's interesting is that there has not been, during this entire explosion of, of uh, private philanthropy for health research, any new private resources allocated for, say, sickle cell research? Nothing. Now, sickle cell is a leading uh, uh, killer of, of African Americans. But there aren't any African American billionaires uh, who are setting up uh, research on that specific issue. And so 
it is important that we continue to uh, have breakthroughs. But who's going to fund that if we don't have an NIH uh, that is robustly funded for basic science? Uh, it probably will not be funded by private individuals. Um, because most of the private individuals who are interested in research in, in the area of disease and health are not interested in sickle cell. Um, and so when we think about justice and philanthropy, these really um, um, tensions, these tensions that I think are pretty stark when you start to interrogate, um, um, I think uh, leave open the question of how much private philanthropy can do to solve uh, public problems writ large. Hi, thank you so much. Um, oh. oh wow. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about, well, my question is related, but if you could speak about the intersection of art, philanthropy, and activism, specifically international acts of solidarity, what's different about this space now than it was maybe 10 years ago? Well, I think what's different about this space is that democracy and civil society is under assault around the world. I mean, I think if you go to, um, I mean, you look at our own country and, and the challenges um, that we see basic fundamental democratic institutions that are essential, uh, that our forefathers enumerated as critical to uh, a flourishing democracy, that some of those institutions uh, are under threat. Um, if you travel to other parts of the world, from the Middle East to India, uh, China, other parts of the world, um, the, the challenge of civil society, I mean, when you talk to people in civil society, they will talk about the shrinking space for civil society. And what they are talking about is that in much of the world, where the United States has led and in fact modeled, and in fact, American philanthropy has helped to seed human rights organizations, organizations advocating in countries like India on behalf of Dalits and lower caste. Um, these organizations are under assault. And so artists are often the first to stand up on behalf of marginalized people. Artists are the risk takers. They are willing to hold the mirror up and make us look. And so the artists whether it be in the Middle East, when you see some of the documentary work coming out of that part of the, of the world, or the work in India, um, in spite of uh, setbacks for the human rights community there, um, you see artists on the front lines. And we've always had that in this country. Uh, I was just uh, with Harry Belafonte and listening to him talk about what it was like to be uh, an artist in, in the 1950s and how he and the other artists uh, use their privilege and their access to basically help finance uh, many of the marches and to support uh, Dr. King and others when they had no money and had very little support. So artists have been on the front lines, um, and that's one of the reasons why we should celebrate and lift up artists in our society. Uh, thank you for your uh, talk. I'm a historian of, of philanthropy, Greg Wachowski is my name, uh, at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, oh, and appreciate your uh, historical take on this, and, and did want to ask a question related to it. It strikes me that in the late 19th century, there was a split between philanthropy and solidarity, and there are two mm -hmm. concepts that have long histories, both with religious and secular backgrounds. Uh, and it seems as if you're moving back towards a sort of sense of solidarity with social justice, and I, I appreciate that. I'm wondering uh, if you can comment a little bit, though, on the way in which professionalization mm -hmm. has kind of forwarded a more philanthropic type of approach versus a solidarity type of approach. And I'll just comment, I appreciate the fact that the Smithsonian has used giving, which is a kind of a, a less um, loaded term uh, as, its, as its definition. So thanks. Thank you. Well, I will certainly uh, be the first to say that uh, there are downsides to, to professionalization. Um, and it's one of the things I think about in my own work um, every day and in my own institution because I do believe that uh, we have to be proximate uh, to the issues, the people, and the communities. And one of the things that happens with professionalization, and not just 
uh, when you have a professional foundation, but I believe what happens when um, any of us who are privileged approach a problem, we, we privilege the knowledge, the credentials of those who have studied the problem, often over the voices and experiences of people who are living with the problem. And I believe that in much of the world, and, in, and certainly in our country too, um, professional philanthropy and uh, family foundations and individual philanthropists um, have often overlooked uh, the very people who are most affected by the problem that we have diagnosed in creating the solutions and interventions. And so I believe that one of the things we have to do better is, is listen and approach our philanthropy with humility, recognizing that people who are probably closest to the problem should be consulted and should be a part of whatever solution we professional social scientists are designing. Um, Secretary Scorton mentioned uh, the challenge of cultural and arts philanthropy in a, a philanthropic realm that's uh, putting a lot of emphasis on quantitative metrics and measurements of effectiveness. Can you speak a little bit about whether or not you see um, culture and arts funding as uh, somewhat uh, sequestered from those imperatives, or how do you actually think about the measurement of effectiveness within uh, culture and arts philanthropy? Well, I believe, of course, there is a role for assessment. Uh, we want to understand the efficacy of any innovation uh, or intervention, but I believe there is a risk in indexing for those things that can be measured and quantified most easily. Uh, there's a risk in philanthropy that that's where we will gravitate towards. Um, when in fact, the things that often matter most in a society aren't quantitatively um, apparent uh, in certainly in a short term. And Einstein talked about this. Um, this is, and this is one of the risks I see with philanthropy, and it's one of the risks that I see with, um, with the kinds of interventions around arts that say the arts have to prove um, that there are jobs associated. Uh, and, and so you see policymakers twisting themselves into uh, pretzels to try to demonstrate that there's an economic development component to whatever the arts program may be. And I just believe that um, for some of us, we should be able to, uh, in a non-defensive way, say that everyone in America deserves beauty. Everyone. And we should not have to defend that idea. And that the role of government in ensuring that is important. And that can't be left simply to private philanthropy or Kickstarter, that in fact there is a role in a democracy for that democracy to have a point of view about its culture and to want to lift its culture up. And as a matter of government policy to say, we Americans, just as the Brits, the Germans, the French, and other nations lift up their culture as a matter of policy, we should do the same thing. And so for me, I, I don't, uh, I can talk about lots of, 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 of examples in arts education, um, for example, where the efficacy of arts education has been proven. But the challenge for me on the question of arts education is that we all know that arts education matters. And so when we talk in this country about um, students, young people needing access to arts, most middle class and privileged people know that and they give that to their kids. I mean, because they can, because we can. People like us in this room, we don't have debates in our homes about should our children have access to the arts? We make sure our children have access to the arts and go to museums and travel and see different cultures and experience the world. That's not a question for any of us. Now, I'm not uh, 
asserting that the role of the government is to ensure that poor kids like me growing up should see the world. Um, but there is something to be said for who's really being left out. Because for the most part, the question around young people being given access to the arts um, is being addressed by most people in this country. It's just not happening for those people who are most vulnerable. And that's the population who needs it most. Darren, last year the Ford Foundation made a tremendous commitment to impact investing under your leadership. Can you just describe why it was important for a philanthropic leader like the Ford Foundation to also be an impact investor? Well, thank you, Laura, for that question. And I believe that impact investing for us uh, is critical because we have a large endowment. We have a $13 billion endowment. And to simply uh, operate uh, on a principle that the work of that endowment is to maximize returns so that we can have strong grant making budgets um, is insufficient. Um, and you know, I'm grateful that we had trustees like Irene Hirano in a way who understood how we could use some part of that $13 billion for social impact and not in any way put at risk the long term responsibilities as fiduciaries to the trust. Um, and so we took a billion dollars um, and we are um, experimenting with different modalities of investing in affordable housing and financial services for the poor and in other innovations. Because I believe that we, we have a responsibility and accountability to use some part of those assets uh, for social impact, for both the financial return and the social return and to simply say, let's look at the spreadsheet and see what the ROI is every quarter and declare victory is insufficient. It's not courageous. And uh, so that's what we're doing. Um, the jury's still out, um, and we will be reporting um, uh, once a year on how we're doing and, and learning together. So. Hey, good morning. I have a question kind of leading off of social impact as it relates specifically to your work with Detroit. Um, you know, one of the things when you hear about bankruptcies of cities and states and countries is you so rarely hear about any type of philanthropy around a resolution in that. And so if you could just talk a little bit about your work um, on the philanthropic committee for the bankruptcy of Detroit and a resolution there and what we can learn as we work with other cities and states um, that, you know, we may think would never go bankrupt and who knows what could happen with pensions, et cetera. Um, so if you could just talk a little bit about that. Well, the first thing I would say in spite of all of the attention that the, the uh, Grand Bargain in Detroit has received, is that philanthropy cannot bail out America's cities. Um, it is not the role uh, of philanthropy to do that. There was an extraordinary, unique convergence, uh, a set of circumstances where a museum's collection was going to be sold, where a group uh, of thousands of retirees' uh, pensions were at risk, um, and a city was on the precipice. And that uh, convergence, uh, I think, compelled us all to, to act and to engage. And my role uh, in that, um, along with my friend Alberto, ever going here at the Knight Foundation, was to try to uh, craft a response from philanthropy that could um, unlock the opportunity to accelerate uh, the resolution of the bankruptcy, which, which happened really through a public-private partnership. So it was, although the philanthropy gets a lot of credit, it was really um, the governor, Rick Snyder, um, the Republican governor of Michigan, who was amazing, who without uh, Governor Snyder, we could not uh, have uh, achieved that. And he uh, went against his advisors uh, in a city where he had no voters. <laughs> very little support, uh, to actually uh, put in place this solution. Um, so I, I think the lesson in that example is not, it's less about what's the lesson for municipal uh, bankruptcy. It's more a lesson for us, as Alberto and I learned, we had to get out of our program boxes. Because as you remember, my friend, the first meeting with the judge, everyone said back to him, 
funding bankruptcies is not in our program guidelines. Um, and, and so saving cities is not in our program guidelines. We do children, we do the environment, we do the arts, and we all had to get out of our boxes in order to step up and make this happen. And so that, to me, is the lesson for philanthropy. We have to, sometimes, there are such powerful ideas and opportunities that we have to get out of our boxes. And so that's the lesson for me. Thank you all very much. This has been a great honor.